Welcome to Catholic Light. Join me, Becca Doherty, each week as we shed a little light while keeping the conversation light. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Catholic Light. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, too, for your patience with uh, some gaps in our schedule over the last couple weeks. Uh, So hopefully you heard the last episode was episode 87, where we talked about the battle of prayer, this really incredible section of the catechism. And then today we'll move into the very last section of the catechism. So we're in part four, section two, and we start to move line by line through the Our Father. Um, thanks to, well, I'm thanking you for all these things, uh, for joining me, for your patience and the gaps in our schedule. Thanks too for bearing with, uh, my congested voice here. Um, we were together with a lot of family and friends over the last, last couple of weeks surrounding Christmas and New Year's. And, um, you know, we shared, shared many things, including sick germs. So here we go. We, I think I've mentioned before that um, my dad now lives with us, and when we first moved in with him that first fall and winter, he was he was sick um, for like two to three months. And one one day, he and a family friend and I were chatting, and he said, "Yeah, I just I can't shake it. It feels like I get sick. I start to get better, and then I get sick again." And without skipping a beat, this family friend who was an educator for many many years, she said, "Oh, that's because you have school aged children in your home now. They bring home everything." He was like, "Right." I was like, "Right." Right. <laughs> so here we go, sharing all the school germ fun. Um, so hopefully you had a very, a very happy, blessed Christmas, a happy, blessed New Year's Eve celebration and New Year, and um, blessings on you and your family and friends in this new year ahead, 2024. While I was in the midst of, of preparations for Christmas and at the tail end of Advent, our parish, as many parishes do, hosted uh, back-to-back nights of confession. So the, the Monday and Tuesday of the last week of Advent, um, our parish had you know confessions where they bring in priests from neighboring parishes and just hear, <laughs> open the gates and, and hear lots of confessions, which is always just really, really beautiful to behold. And so uh, Dan and I had planned, okay, one of us, because the lines will probably be long, you know, one of us will go while the other stays with the kids and then, you know, tag you're it and, and flip flop. So I was headed in, I was leaving for church to go to confession. And as I was walking out the door, the kids are asking like, where are you going? And Peter, our three-year-old said, oh, can I go with you? I said, you can, but it's going to be boring. I don't think you're going to want to go. The line's going to be long. And, um, We'll basically be sitting in a quiet church, and Peter's not the most quiet of children. And uh, he said, no, 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 I want to go. And so I thought, oh, okay, I don't want to de- deter a child from going to church. I said, okay, just so you know, we're going to be sitting. We can't chat, and it's going to be long. He said, yeah, 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 okay. <clears throat> so Peter comes with me to confession in the evening, and the line is long. So as we're making our way through uh, the line to confession, he and we're getting closer and closer. I'm thinking like, okay, when I get to the front, how's this going to work? He's old enough to know, like, as I'm confessing, if he goes into confession with me, he would recognize, like, hmm, that's weird that mommy's saying I'm sorry for doing this. Um, but he's kind of like too little to sit by himself. So I was sitting by a friend. He said, oh, he can, you know, stay with me. But thanks be to God, before we got to the priest, um, Peter fell asleep in my lap. So I thought, oh, this is actually kind of perfect. So I go up to the the confessional with a sleeping Peter in my arms. I said, you know, Father, thanks for going with the flow here. My son wanted to come, you know, et cetera. So I I start my confession with a sleeping Peter in my arms. And uh, as I'm going through my confession, I, I, I got to a point, I got to a sin where basically I confessed, I had committed at the beginning of Advent to pray for a friend's intention. And then in conjunction with that prayer, I told Jesus, I'm going to fast from something, um, the old prayer and fasting. And as I've shared with you on previous episodes, I stink at fasting. So a number of times I said, I'll fast from throughout the course of Advent. 
from something um, as I pray for this intention. And then a number of times throughout Advent, I did not succeed in the fasting part. And so as part of my confession, I said, Father, I'm sorry for, I said, I don't know if this is a sin, but I'm sorry that I did not uphold. I basically made this commitment to Jesus and then I stunk at it. (laughs) Um, So I don't know if I should confess it and if I confess it, what that would be. I'm sorry for my lack of perseverance, my lack of fortitude, my lack of grit. Um, I'm sorry for laziness or whatever that is. And this priest who he looked to be no older than 35, if that was um, just so already so wise and profoundly, um, profoundly wonderful in his priesthood. He said, he listened as I'm like kind of bumbling through, like, I don't know what, what exactly to confess there. Um, he said, uh, what you want to confess is actually the sin of pride. He said, you think that you're further along in your prayer life or your walk with Jesus, that you would be able to commit to something and then see it through. But you can't, um, or you haven't been able to, and that's okay. Um, but just recognize that like, you think you can do it, or you think, like, oh, I'm up for this task, and you're not. Um, but as you think about that, and he looks down at this, this sleeping three-year-old in my arms, who is a little wild man, but looked just so peaceful and angelic. Um, He said, just like you wouldn't go into your son's messy room and, you know, flip out and say very harshly, like, clean up your room. How could you let this happen? He said, we have a loving father um, who very gently brings us along, who very gently, in this case, helps us make better sacrifices or longer or more diligent, persevering sacrifices. But when we mess up, you know, you say you're sorry, you get back up, you try again, and you recognize that that we have a loving Father who forgives us, who loves us, and is trying to help us along, who is not, you know, ready and waiting to, to yell at us or to punish us um, for not having upheld, you know, our end of the bargain or obeyed the rules. And it was just so, I started crying in confession. Um, It was just so beautiful the way that that Jesus orchestrated that moment. My my sleeping son, literally asleep in my arms, um, as I'm confessing something that the priest then helps me understand by, by recognizing our loving father. It was just so beautiful and you know, provided, it continues to provide uh, this point of reflection for me on the, the love of the father who, who is not this indulgent, permissive father that says like, ah, don't worry about it. You don't need to sacrifice. I don't care. It's all good. He, he wants us to sacrifice, not because he needs it, but because it's good for us. It helps us personally um, be purified, have things stripped away, um, but then also to come into solidarity. So in my case, uh, come into deeper solidarity with this friend um, who's praying for a certain intention. And so not only was it a great point of reflection, but as God would have it, it was just um, so perfectly timed as we begin this last, last section of the catechism, which goes through the Our Father. This God in whom we believe, this infinite God, the creator of the universe, the creator of each of us, the one who holds us, sustains our existence, um, reveals himself to us. So God does not have to reveal himself, does not have to show us who he is. Um, The God who sends his son out of love for us to suffer and die so he can open the gates of heaven, so we can be purified, we can turn back to him and come back into communion with him after our sin. Um, He... He invites us to call him Father, our Father, uh, this this very intimate, um, loving, close term he uses uh, as he he teaches us to pray. He explains to us our relationship with him and his relationship with us. How incredible! What a gift! What a what loving, tender mercy! And so we'll talk today. We'll hit on just a couple points from the Catechism. Um, Today's section, paragraphs 2759 through 2802, we'll go through the the first two lines of the Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven. And in paragraph 2777, we read this quote from St. Peter Chrysologus, who talks about how if we we saw ourselves, we saw our state um, separate from the love of the Father, we would just, we would die of sadness and despair. Um, what, what we look like 
what we are in our sinfulness, the reality of the human sinful condition. But God uh, reveals that to us kind of gently as he speaks of his love for us. And so St. Peter Chrysologus says, our awareness of our status as slaves would make us sink into the ground and our earthly condition would dissolve into dust if the authority of our Father himself and the Spirit of his Son had not impelled us to this cry, Abba, Father, when would a mortal dare call God Father if man's innermost being were not animated by power from on high? So who would, what mortal would dare to call God our Father? Think of some of the other religions that are currently practiced throughout the world. Think of religions that have been practiced in the past um, or some of the portrayals of certain gods or certain beliefs in gods. Think of, let's think of the 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 Greek mythological understanding of the gods, to call Zeus um, or Kronos our father. I think before those words crossed our lips, the the understanding of, of those gods um, would have just leveled us to the ground. And here, the, the true, one, infinite, almighty God, the creator of the universe, invites us, teaches us to pray, to call him our father. 2780 goes on to say, we can invoke God as Father because he is revealed to us by his Son become man and because his Spirit makes him known to us. The personal relation of the Son to the Father is something that man cannot conceive of, nor the angelic powers even dimly see. And yet the Spirit of the Son grants a participation in that very relation to us who believe that Jesus is the Christ and that we are born of God. 2781 goes on to say, when we pray to the Father, we are in communion with him and with his son, Jesus Christ. Then we know and recognize him with an ever new sense of wonder, an ever new sense of wonder. It's so, it was so many dimensions of our faith, so many teachings of our faith, um, because we hear them again and again through our CIA homilies, theology classes. Um, it's just very easy to take these things for granted. But we, we believe in a God, again, an infinite God, creator of the universe, who teaches us, who tells us to call him Father, to pray to him as our Father. What a gift. The Catechism highlights first the, the Father dimension of our Father and then goes on to speak of the Our dimension of the Our Father. 2792 says, If we pray the Our Father sincerely, we leave individualism behind. Because the love that we receive frees us from it. The our at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, like the us of the last four petitions, excludes no one. If we are to say it truthfully, our divisions and oppositions have to be overcome. So the our part of the Our Father of the Lord's Prayer reminds us each time we pray it that the Father has sent his Son for all of us. Whether, whether we know the Lord or not, whether we have encountered the Catholic Church and her teachings or not, God came to save all, calls all back to himself through the Son. 2793 goes on to say, The baptized cannot pray to, quote unquote, our Father without bringing before him all those for whom he gave his beloved Son. So Jesus Christ came to suffer and die to open the gates of heaven for each and every human being who ever lived, is living, and ever will live. God's love has no bounds, neither should our prayer. Praying our Father opens to us the dimensions of his love revealed in Christ, praying with and for all who do not yet know him, so that Christ may gather into one the children of God. And then that paragraph ends by saying, God's care for all men and for the whole of creation has inspired all the great practitioners of prayer. It should extend our prayer to the full breadth of love whenever we dare to say, our Father. So every time we pray that Our Father, that's a reminder to us um, that we have been invited by the infinite creator of the universe to be in communion with him as a father and a child are in communion, and to remember that that all have been invited into that, and therefore we should pray for, for all to come to realize that and, and truly enter into that communion. After discussing that that phrase, our father, the catechism goes on to talk about the line, who art in heaven. This biblical expression does not mean a place or space, but a way of being. It does not mean that God is distant, but majestic. Our father is not elsewhere. He transcends everything we can conceive of his holiness. 
It is precisely because he is thrice holy, so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that he is so close to the humble and contrite heart. So when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, we're not uh, to envision this remote God in a remote place. Um, However, what's conjured up by picturing a remote God in a remote place is is supposed to remind us that he is transcendent. He is above and beyond all, such that we as finite human beings cannot comprehend, fully comprehend who he is and what he's about. Um, And yet, that Catholic both and, he is simultaneously, he is above and beyond. We cannot fully comprehend him. And yet he reveals himself to us as a father, this intimate relationship, uh, reminding us that he is close to us physically and spiritually. So that was paragraph 2794. In the in brief section in paragraph 2802, the catechism summarizes once again, who art in heaven does not refer to a place, but to God's majesty and his presence in the hearts of the just. Heaven, the Father's house, is the true homeland toward which we are heading and to which already we belong. So it's it's sin, 2795 says, sin has exiled us from the land of the covenant, but conversion of heart enables us to return to the Father, to heaven. So heaven, the Father's house, is the true homeland toward which we are heading and to which already we belong. So come, Lord Jesus, please give us the grace to receive this mystery, receive this incredible gift, this grace, this blessing, uh, in that you are a God of revelation, a God who has revealed himself to us and invites us into communion with him, very specifically teaching us the prayer of the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer, reminding us again and again and again that you love us, um, that you are present to us, and that you have called us ever deeper into this this heavenly home with you. So give us the grace to renounce our sin, to go to the sacrament of confession, to put that sin at the foot of the cross, that we may enter more deeply into this heavenly home with you and allow you to take take up residence to find a home in our hearts. May we be and have, uh, may we be just and have hearts of the just as the catechism discusses here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we'll take a brief break and then we'll return on the second half of the episode to read paragraphs 2759 through 2802. Thanks for sticking around. You are listening to Catholic Light. Thank you for joining me each week as we read through the Catechism of the Catholic Church and discuss some of its beautiful teachings. Hi, and welcome back. We'll now read paragraphs 2759 through 2802 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Section 2, the Lord's Prayer, Our Father. Jesus was praying at a certain place, and when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. In response to this request, the Lord entrusts to his disciples and to his church the fundamental Christian prayer. St. Luke presents a brief text of five petitions, while St. Matthew gives a more developed version of seven petitions. The liturgical tradition of the Church has retained St. Matthew's text. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Very early on, liturgical usage concluded the Lord's Prayer with a doxology. In the Didache, we find, For yours are the power and the glory forever. The apostolic constitutions add to the beginning, The kingdom, and this is the formula retained to our day in ecumenical prayer. The Byzantine tradition adds after the glory, the words Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Roman Missal develops the last petition in the explicit perspective of awaiting our blessed hope and of the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then comes the assembly's acclamation or the repetition of the doxology from the apostolic constitutions. Article 1, the summary of the whole gospel. The Lord's Prayer is truly the summary of the whole gospel. Since the Lord, after handing over the practice of prayer, said elsewhere, ask and you will receive, and since everyone has petitions which are peculiar to his circumstances, the regular and appropriate prayer, the Lord's Prayer, is said first, as the foundation of further desires. At the center of the scriptures, after showing how the Psalms are the principal food of Christian prayer and flow together in the petitions of the Our Father, St. Augustine concludes, run through all the words of the holy prayers in scripture, and I do not think that you will find anything in them that is not contained and included in the Lord's Prayer. 
All the scriptures, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms are fulfilled in Christ. The gospel is this good news. Its first proclamation is summarized by St. Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. The prayer to our Father is at the center of this proclamation. It is in this context that each petition bequeathed to us by the Lord is illuminated. The Lord's Prayer is the most perfect of prayers. In it, we ask not only for all the things we can rightly desire, but also in the sequence that they should be desired. This prayer not only teaches us to ask for things, but also in what order we should desire them. That's from St. Thomas Aquinas. The Sermon on the Mount is teaching for life. The Our Father is a prayer. But in both, the one and the other, the Spirit of the Lord, gives new form to our desires, those inner movements that animate our lives. Jesus teaches us this new life by his words. He teaches us to ask for it by our prayer. The rightness of our life in him will depend on the rightness of our prayer. The Lord's Prayer. The traditional expression, the Lord's Prayer, or Oratio Dominica, means that the prayer to our Father is taught and given to us by the Lord Jesus. The prayer that comes to us from Jesus is truly unique. It is of the Lord. On the one hand, in the words of this prayer, the only Son gives us the words the Father gave him. He is the master of our prayer. On the other, as word incarnate, he knows in his human heart the needs of his human brothers and sisters and reveals them to us. He is the model of our prayer. But Jesus does not give us a formula to repeat mechanically. As in every vocal prayer, it is through the word of God that the Holy Spirit teaches the children of God to pray to their Father. Jesus not only gives us the words of our filial prayer, at the same time he gives us the Spirit by whom these words become in us spirit and life. Even more, the proof and possibility of our filial prayer is that of the Father, excuse me, is that the Father sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Since our prayer sets forth our desires before God, it is again the Father, He who searches the hearts of men, who knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The prayer to our Father is inserted into the mysterious mission of the Son and of the Spirit. The Prayer of the Church. This indivisible gift of the Lord's words and of the Holy Spirit who gives life to them in the hearts of believers has been received and lived by the church from the beginning. The first communities pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day in place of the 18 benedictions customary in Jewish piety. According to the apostolic tradition, the Lord's Prayer is essentially rooted in liturgical prayer. The Lord teaches us to make prayer in common for all our brethren. For he did not say, My Father who art in heaven, but our Father, offering petitions for the common body. That was St. John Chrysostom. In all the liturgical traditions, the Lord's Prayer is an integral part of the major hours of the divine office. In the three sacraments of Christian initiation, its ecclesial character is especially in evidence. In baptism and confirmation, the handing on or traditio of the Lord's Prayer signifies new birth into the divine life. Since Christian prayers are speaking to God with the very word of God, those who are born anew through the living and abiding word of God learn to invoke their Father by the one word he always hears. They can henceforth do so, for the seal of the Holy Spirit's anointing is indelibly placed on their hearts, ears, lips, indeed their whole filial being. This is why most of the patristic commentaries on the Our Father are addressed to catechumens and neophytes. When the church prays the Lord's Prayer, it is always the people made up of the newborn who pray and obtain mercy. In the Eucharistic liturgy, the Lord's Prayer appears as the prayer of the whole church and there reveals its full meaning and efficacy. Placed between the anaphora, or the Eucharistic prayer, and the communion, the Lord's Prayer sums up on the one hand all the petitions and intercessions expressed in the movement of the epiclesis, and on the other, knocks at the door of the banquet of the kingdom, which sacramental communion anticipates. In the Eucharist, the Lord's Prayer also reveals the eschatological character of its petitions. It is the proper prayer of the end time, the time of salvation that began with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and will be fulfilled with the Lord's return. The petitions addressed to our Father, as distinct from the prayers of the Old Covenant, rely on the mystery of salvation already accomplished once for all in Christ crucified and risen. From this unshakable faith springs forth the hope that sustains each of the seven petitions, which express the groanings of the present age, this time of patience and expectation, during which it does not yet appear what we shall be. The Eucharist and the Lord's Prayer look eagerly for the Lord's return until he comes. In brief, in response to his disciples' request, Lord, teach us to pray, Jesus entrusts them with the fundamental Christian prayer, the Our Father. 
The Lord's Prayer is truly the summary of the whole gospel, the most perfect of prayers. It is at the center of the scriptures. It is called the Lord's Prayer because it comes to us from the Lord Jesus, the master and model of our prayer. The Lord's Prayer is the quintessential prayer of the church. It is an integral part of the major hours of the divine office and of the sacraments of Christian initiation, baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. Integrated into the Eucharist, it reveals the eschatological character of its petitions, hoping for the Lord until he comes. Article 2, Our Father Who Art in Heaven. We dare to say. In the Roman liturgy, the Eucharistic assembly is invited to pray to our Heavenly Father with filial boldness. The Eastern liturgies develop and use similar expressions. Dare in all confidence. Make us worthy of. From the burning bush, Moses heard a voice saying to him, Do not come near. Put off your shoes from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Only Jesus could cross that threshold of the divine holiness. For when he had made purification for sins, he brought us into the Father's presence. Here am I and the children God has given me. Our awareness of our status as slaves would make us sink into the ground and our earthly condition would dissolve into dust if the authority of our Father himself and the Spirit of his Son had not impelled us to this cry, Abba, Father. When would a mortal dare call God Father if man's innermost being were not animated by power from on high? And that's St. Peter Chrysologus. This power of the Spirit who introduces us to the Lord's Prayer is expressed in the liturgies of East and of West by the beautiful, beautiful, characteristically Christian expression, parhesia, straightforward simplicity, filial trust, joyous assurance, humble boldness, the certainty of being loved. Father, before we make our own this first exclamation of the Lord's Prayer, we must humbly cleanse our hearts of certain false images drawn from this world. Humility makes us recognize that no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him, that is, to little children. The purification of our hearts has to do with paternal or maternal images, stemming from our personal and cultural history, and influencing our relationship with God. God our Father transcends the categories of the created world. To impose our own ideas in this area upon Him would be to fabricate idols to adore or pull down. To pray to the Father is to enter into his mystery as he is, and as the Son has revealed him to us. The expression God the Father had never been revealed to anyone. When Moses himself asked God who he was, he heard another name. The Father's name has been revealed to us in the Son, for the name Son implies the new name, Father. That comes from Tertullian. We can invoke God as Father because he is revealed to us by his Son, become man, and because his Spirit makes him known to us. The personal relation of the Son to the Father is something that man cannot conceive of, nor the angelic powers even dimly see. And yet, the Spirit of the Son grants a participation in that very relation to us, who believe that Jesus is the Christ and that we are born of God. When we pray to the Father, we are in communion with Him and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Then we know and recognize Him with an ever new sense of wonder. The first phase of the Our Father is a blessing of adoration, before it is a supplication. For it is the glory of God that we should recognize him as Father, the true God. We give him thanks for having revealed his name to us, for the gift of believing in it, and for the indwelling of his presence in us. We can adore the Father because he has caused us to be reborn to his life by adopting us as his children and in his only Son. By baptism, he incorporates us into the body of Christ. Through the anointing of his Spirit who flows from the head to the members, he makes us other Christs. God indeed, who has predestined us to adoption as his sons, has conformed us to the glorious body of Christ. So then, you who have become sharers in Christ are appropriately called Christs. That's from St. Cyril of Jerusalem. The new man, reborn and restored to his God by grace, says first of all, Father, because he has now begun to be a son. That's from St. Cyprian. Thus the Lord's Prayer reveals us to ourselves at the same time that it reveals the Father to us. O man, you did not dare to raise your face to heaven. You lowered your eyes to the earth, and suddenly you have received the grace of Christ. All your sins have been forgiven. From being a wicked servant, you have become a good son. Then raise your eyes to the Father who has begotten you through baptism, to the Father who has redeemed you through his Son, and say, Our Father. But do not claim any privilege. He is the Father in a special way only of Christ, but he is the common Father of us all. Because while he has begotten only Christ, he has created us. Then also say by his grace, our Father, so that you may merit being his son. That's from St. Ambrose. 
The free gift of adoption requires on our part continual conversion and new life. Praying to our Father should develop in us two fundamental dispositions. First, the desire to become like Him. Though created in His image, we are restored to His likeness by grace, and we must respond to this grace. We must remember and know that when we call God our Father, we ought to behave as sons of God. That's from St. Cyprian. You cannot call the God of all kindness your Father if you preserve a cruel and inhuman heart. For in this case, you no longer have in you the marks of the Heavenly Father's kindness. That's from St. John Chrysostom. We must contemplate the beauty of the Father without ceasing and adorn our own souls accordingly. That's from St. Gregory of Nyssa. Second, a humble and trusting heart that enables us to turn and become like children, for it is to little children that the Father is revealed. The prayer is accomplished by the contemplation of God alone and by the warmth of love, through which the soul, molded and directed to love Him, speaks very familiarly to God as to its own Father with special devotion. That's from St. John Cashin. Our Father, at this name, love is aroused in us, and the confidence of, of, of obtaining what we are about to ask. What would he not give to his children who ask, since he has already granted them the gift of being his children? And that's from St. Augustine. Our Father. Our Father refers to God. The adjective, as used by us, does not express possession, but an entirely new relationship with God. When we say our Father, we recognize first that all his promises of love announced by the prophets are fulfilled in the new and eternal covenant in his Christ. We have become his people, and he is henceforth our God. This new relationship is the purely gratuitous gift of belonging to each other. We are, we are to respond to grace and truth given us in Jesus Christ with love and faithfulness. Since the Lord's prayer is that of his people in the end time, this hour also expresses the certitude of our hope in God's ultimate promise. In the new Jerusalem, he will say to the victor, I will be his God and he shall be my son. When we pray to our Father, we personally address the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By doing so, we do not divide the Godhead, since the Father is its source and origin, but rather confess that the Son is entirely begotten by him and the Holy Spirit proceeds from him. We are not confusing the persons, for we confess that our communion is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, in their one Holy Spirit. The Holy Trinity is consubstantial and indivis indivisible. When we pray to the Father, we adore and glorify Him together with the Son and the Holy Spirit. Grammatically, our qualifies a reality common to more than one person. There is only one God, and He is recognized as Father by those who, through faith in His only Son, are reborn of Him by water and the Spirit. The Church is this new communion of God and men. United with the only Son, who has become the firstborn among many brethren, she is in communion with one and the same Father in one and the same Holy Spirit. In praying our Father, each of the baptized is praying in this communion. The company of those who believed were of one heart and soul. For this reason, in spite of the divisions among Christians, this prayer to our Father remains our common patrimony and an urgent summons for all the baptized. In communion by faith in Christ and by baptism, they ought to join in Jesus' prayer for the unity of his disciples. Finally, if we pray the Our Father sincerely, we leave individualism behind, because the love that we receive frees us from it. The hour at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, like the us of the last four petitions, excludes no one. If we are to say it truthfully, our divisions and oppositions have to be overcome. The baptized cannot pray to our Father without bringing before him all those for whom he gave his beloved Son. God's love has no bounds, neither should our prayer. Praying our Father opens to us the dimensions of his love revealed in Christ. Praying with and for all who do not yet know him, so that Christ may gather into one the children of God. God's care for all men and for the whole of creation has inspired all the great practitioners of prayer. It should extend our prayer to the full breadth of love whenever we dare to say, Our Father. Who art in heaven. This biblical expression does not mean a place or space, but a way of being. It does not mean that God is distant, but majestic. Our Father is not elsewhere. He transcends everything we can conceive of his holiness. It is precisely because he is thrice holy that he is so close to the humble and contrite heart. Our Father, who art in heaven, is rightly understood to mean that God is in the hearts of the just, as in his holy temple. At the same time, it means that those who pray should desire the one they invoke to dwell in them. That comes from St. Augustine. Heaven could also be those who bear the image of the heavenly world, and in whom God dwells and tarries. 
That's from St. Cyril of Jerusalem. The symbol of the heavens refers us back to the mystery of the covenant we are living when we pray to our Father. He is in heaven, his dwelling place. The Father's house is our homeland. Sin has exiled us from the land of the covenant, but conversion of heart enables us to return to the Father, to heaven. In Christ, then, heaven and earth are reconciled, for the Son alone descended from heaven and causes us to ascend there with him by his cross, resurrection, and ascension. When the church prays, Our Father who art in heaven, she is professing that we are the people of God, already seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and hidden with Christ in God. Yet at the same time, here indeed we groan and long to put on our heavenly dwelling. Christians are in the flesh, but do not live according to the flesh. They spend their lives on earth, but are citizens of heaven. In brief, simple and faithful trust, humble and joyous assurance are the proper dispositions for one who prays the Our Father. We can invoke God as Father because the Son of God made man has revealed him to us. In this Son, through baptism, we are incorporated and adopted as sons of God. The Lord's Prayer brings us into communion with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. At the same time, it reveals us to ourselves. Praying to our Father should develop in us the will to become like him and foster in us a humble and trusting heart. When we say Our Father, we are invoking the new covenant in Christ Jesus, communion with the Holy Trinity, and the divine love which spreads through the church to encompass the world. Who art in heaven does not refer to a place, but to God's majesty and his presence in the hearts of the just. Heaven, the Father's house, is the true homeland toward which we are heading and to which already we belong. This brings us to the end of our reading selection, the end of our episode. Thanks for joining me for another week. Between this week and next week's episode, please pray for me. I'll be praying for you. And in the meantime, God bless you. Thanks for joining me this week on Catholic Light. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this podcast with your family and your friends. And connect with me through Facebook and Instagram. I'll see you next week. And in the meantime, God bless you.